Meet the Witcher tabletop role-playing game. This is Jane's copy. She picked it up after her group decided they wanted to run Witcher for their next campaign. Of course, to play, she'll need to make a character. While flipping through the book, Jane comes across a picture of a woman in the middle of sawing off a man's arm. It's a powerful image and one that fires up Jane's imagination. She wants to know more about this woman and decides the best way to find out more is to create her. There are four separate races available in the game. Humans, Elves, Dwarves, and Witchers. Witchers count as a separate race here because their exposure to mutagens alter them dramatically. Each race has its own unique perks, but can also bring trouble depending on where the game is taking place. For example, Elves aren't much liked in the North, while humans don't do well in the Elder Lands. The woman in the picture which inspired Jane was obviously a human, so that's her pick. She notes the perks humans receive on her character sheet. Trustworthy, which grants her a plus one bonus to certain social interactions with other humans. Ingenuity, which gives her one rank of the deduction skill. And Blindly Stubborn, which lets her reroll certain fail checks on occasion. That done, it's on to the next step. You can call LifePath a background generator. It helps you understand where your character came from and determine some of the important events which help shape their lives. The life path doesn't fill in all the blanks, but gives you a skeleton you can build around and is especially helpful if you aren't familiar with every aspect of the world. Each step along the life path can be chosen by the player or rolled randomly. Consult with your GM to determine which method is allowed in your game. Because their lives are so unique, Witchers have their own life path, which can be found in the Witcher chapter starting on page 237. Jane's intrigued by the idea of generating a story based on random rolls, so she grabs her dice and starts. She begins with Homeland. Jane rolls a die and it comes up odd, which means she's from the Northern Kingdoms. She moves on to the Northern Origin chart, rolls d10, and gets a 2. Her character is from Kedwin, an insular kingdom with a hardy and independent people. Being born in Kedwin gives her one rank in the Endurance skill. From Homeland, Jane moves down to the family table. She rolls even, which means at least some of her family is still alive. As directed, she rolls on the next table down, parents. Again, she rolls even. So her parents are still alive. That's a fairly happy background for someone in the world of The Witcher. The flow of your character's life path may change depending on what you roll. For example, since Jane's family and parents are both still alive, she moves on to the family status table. She rolls a 5 and finds out her parents are artisans, which means she begins play with three common diagrams or formula, which she notes for later. Next comes her most influential friend. This time, she rolls a 1 and consults the northern status column. It turns out it isn't one specific friend, but religion as a whole which influenced Jane's character. Interesting. She'll start play with a holy text, which Jane notes for later. For siblings, Jane rolls a 1 again. This means she has one sibling. She has to roll four times on the next chart to determine her sibling's gender, age, feelings about her, and personality. She rolls a 5, so it's a brother, a 10, which means it's a twin, an 8, that means her twin likes her, and a 2, so her twin has an aggressive personality. At this point, Jane pauses her character generation. She knows another person in her group is making a man-at-arms named Yuri. Wouldn't it be neat if the sibling Jane had just rolled up was that party member? The GM and Yuri's player agree. Of course, Yuri's player has to change a few points on his own life path, but he's fine with that. Remember, life paths should help inspire your character story, but it shouldn't override it. Don't be afraid to consult with your GM and make changes if you need to. At this point, Jane decides to name her character Yura. Her parents, it turned out, are the sort to pick similar names for their twin children. On to life events. Yura's in her late 20s. She rolls once on the life events table for each full decade she's been alive, which means twice. The first roll is a 5. That's an ally or an enemy. The second roll is a 1. That's a fortune or a misfortune. Jane will take care of the ally or enemy first. She rolls 1d10 and it comes up even. That's an ally. With a 2, she determines the ally is a woman, and with another 2, it's a mage. The final roll is a 3. The mage saved her from something. Next, the fortune or misfortune. This time, Jane rolls odd on her 1d10. That means she suffered misfortune in her life. She rolls on the misfortune table for a 9. That means she suffered from either a physical or a mental incapacitation. One more roll, this time a 3, and she finds out she was poisoned. She notes her health points will be 5 lower than normal when she gets to that point in character generation. Finally, there's personal style. Jane can roll randomly here to determine clothing, personality, hairstyle, affectations, and various values. Instead, she decides to pick for two reasons. First, she wants her style to match the woman in the picture. Second, because she feels she's got a good handle on her character's motivation at this point and doesn't want to mess that up. For style, Jane picks utilitarian clothing, idealistic personality, long and loose hairstyle, 
and trinkets for affectations. Jane decides Yura is always ready to help out, which means she needs clothing which can be washed to blood easily, and has a bright view of the world, and that she likes to collect shiny little baubles. For values, Jane decides Yura's most valued person is her twin brother Yuri, that she's honorable, and that she thinks all life is valuable. Looking over her life path and consulting with Yuri's player, Jane writes down a quick background for Yura. She and her twin brother grew up in a small mountain village, the children of alchemists. From an early age, Jane was the bright and cheerful of the twins, while her brother was the dour one. She especially enjoyed spending time at the local temple of Melatella. At a young age, Yura accidentally drank a toxic concoction her parents made. Luckily, a passing sorceress with a gift for healing was visiting. The sorceress helped Yura recover. Although the incident permanently weakened Yura's constitution, it also inspired her to help others. Since Yura couldn't do magic, she eventually trained to become a doctor in order to heal others. Currently, she's traveling with her brother, who followed a more martial path, as they make their way across the north. It still needs work, but Jane's satisfied for now. She'll talk to Yuri's player and the GM more, and work out the specifics later. There are nine professions available in the Witcher tabletop role-playing game. Bard, Craftsman, Criminal, Doctor, Mage, Man-at-Arms, Merchant, Priest, and Witcher. To play a Witcher, you have to choose both the Witcher race and the Witcher profession. Your profession determines your defining and profession skills, your vigor threshold, any magical perks you might get, and some starting gear. Your profession also determines which skill tree you advance along. Each skill tree has three branches, which spread out from your profession's unique defining skill. For now, though, don't worry too much about it, since you won't be starting with any ranks in the skills on your skill tree except your defining skill. Obviously, Yura is going to be a doctor, which is one of the nine professions available. Statistics are inherent physical and mental abilities which everyone has. There's two ways of determining a character's statistics. One way is to roll nine 1d10s, re-rolling any 1s and 2s, and then assigning each number rolled to one of the nine statistics. There's also the point buy system, where you buy your statistics using a pool of points. The exact size of the pool varies depending on the starting power level of the game. It's important to note that no statistic can have a value higher than 10 unless it is raised by a racial perk or a life path event. Jane's GM informs her they'll be using the point buy system. Jane has 60 points to spend on the nine statistics, intelligence, reflexes, dexterity, body, speed, empathy, craft, will, and luck. Since each skill works with a specific statistic to help determine if a character's action succeeds or fails, Jane takes some time to read through the skill lists now and figure out which ones are important for her as a doctor and which ones fit her backstory. In the end, she decides on Intelligence 8, Reflexes 6, Dexterity 6, Body 5, Speed 5, Empathy 7, Craft 9, Will 8, and Luck 6. The high craft is obvious based on her background. Not only is she a doctor, but she's the child of two alchemists. A high intelligence and empathy also makes sense for a doctor with a cheerful outlook on life. Jane decides Yura must be pretty stubborn since she's almost 30 and her spirit hasn't been broken by the dark world around her yet, so she gives her a high will. The remaining statistics are in the medium range since the damage from the poison she ingested as a child infects her to this day. There are several statistics which are important but not bought with points. These are known as derived statistics. Most can be determined using the formulas and tables on pages 47 and 48. Vigor is set by profession and helps determine how much magic a magic user can cast without taking physical damage. As a doctor, Yura's vigor is zero. Stun is a number you roll against under certain circumstances to see if you are stunned or not. It's based on body plus will divided by two. Yura's stun is six. Run is speed times three, 15 in Yura's case. Leap is run divided by five, or three in Yura's case. Health points are figured out by consulting a chart in the book. Under normal circumstances, Yura would have 30 health points, but because she was poisoned as a child and suffered a physical impairment because of it, she has 25 health points instead. Yura's stamina, on the other hand, is 30. Her encumbrance, or how much she can carry without being slowed down, is 50 kilos. Her recovery, or how much she heals per day, is 6. While statistics are inherent, skills are learned and represent areas of expertise. During character creation, there are two types of skills you'll buy, profession skills and pickup skills. Profession skills are the ones listed on the page detailing your profession, including the unique defining skill. They're the skills you learned as part of your trade. 
You have 44 points to spend on profession skills, and you must have at least one rank in each of them. Pickup skills represent skills you've learned outside your trade, perhaps as part of a hobby or part of your background. You have a number of points equal to your intelligence plus reflex to spend on pickup skills, and they cannot be spent on any skills in your profession package. The maximum starting rank of any skill is 6. This cap can be raised by racial perks, such as a human's deduction, but not by life path bonuses. If you get a plus 1 from a skill in your life path, it gives you a free rank in that skill, but your maximum is still 6. Most skills cost 1 point per rank, but some cost 2 points per rank. Those are marked with a 2 next to their name on the skill list on page 49. Finally, you can't start playing with ranks in any of the skills on your skill tree except your profession's unique defining skill. However, having 5 ranks in a skill on your skill tree does give you access to the next level of your branch at rank 0. So if you have a 5 in your defining skill, you can use the first skill on each branch of your skill tree at rank 0, if possible. Jane starts with your profession skills as a doctor. She has 44 points to spend on the defining skill of healing hands, alchemy, business, charisma, courage, deduction, human perception, resist coercion, small blades, social etiquette, and wilderness survival. Thanks to being human, she already has one rank in deduction. She also notes alchemy costs two points per rank, so getting to rank one in each costs 11 points. That leaves her with 33 points to spend. Thinking over her background, she decides alchemy, healing hands, and wilderness survival, which governs the foraging of alchemical materials, all need to be high. She puts five more points into healing hands for a total of six ranks, eight points into alchemy because it costs double for a total of five ranks, and four more points into wilderness survival for a total of five ranks. Looking over the rest of the skills, Jane brings charisma up to three, courage up to four, deduction up to three, human perception up to four, resist coercion up to three, and small blades to three. She decides Yura is more interested in healing than schmoozing clients, so only puts one more point into business and social etiquette. That's 44 points spent, so she moves on to pickup skills. With the reflexes of 6 and an intelligence of 8, Jane has 14 points to spend on pickup skills for Yura. Jane thinks Yura shouldn't be totally useless in combat, but should stay away from enemies, so spends 3 points on crossbow and 3 on dodge escape. Yura didn't just learn medicine at school, so she also buys gambling 2 and education 2. The remaining 4 points go into buying Elder Speech at rank 2, since all languages cost 2 points per rank. Finally, she adds the 1 rank of endurance she picked up as a benefit from the homeland part of her life path. How much money you start with depends on your profession, as shown on the chart on page 71. You can spend your starting coin on equipment, but can also keep it to use when the game begins. As a doctor, Yura starts with 150 crowns times 2d6. Jane rolls a 5 and a 5 for a total of 10, so she has 1,500 crowns to begin with. Figuring out what gear you start play with is done in two steps. Every profession has a list of potential starting gear. The player can pick a certain number of items from this list and add it to their inventory at no cost. Some professions also have starting gear they receive no matter what. Witchers, for example, always start with an assortment of Witcher-specific goodies. Any items received during your life path are also added to your inventory at no cost. Remaining items, including crafting diagrams and formula, have to be purchased using the starting funds determined in Step 6. Some items not in the main book can be found in Rodolph's Wagon, a free PDF available at rtalzoriangames.com. Jane first adds the holy text she received as part of her life path to her inventory. She lists it as the holy book of Melatel. Next, she picks five items from the ten possibilities on the doctor starting gear list. Sterilizing fluid times 10, a surgeon's kit, a writing kit, a blanket, and a large tent. Finally, she flips to the gear section of the rulebook. While it's tempting to skip to the weapons and armor, both of which tend to be expensive, she decides to buy her other essentials first. Yura will need an alchemy set, cooking tools, 10 empty bottles for collecting samples, a water skin, 5 days of trail rations, a lantern, soap, 2 additional sets of basic clothing, a satchel, flint and steel, a holy symbol, and an extra journal. This lowers her funds from 1,500 crowns to 1,243 crowns. Looking the list over, Jane realizes Yura can't carry it at all without being overburdened, so Jane also buys a mule and a set of saddlebags. That's an additional 300 crowns, bringing her funds to 943. With provisions and professional equipment out of the way, Jane takes a look at weapons and armor. Since Yura has the archery skill, she picks out a hand crossbow and 50 bolts for it. For armor, she wants Yura to be protected without being drowned in metal and leather. So she buys a double woven hood, a double woven gambeson, 
and a pair of cavalry trousers. That eats a big chunk of her money. She has 108 left. She turns to the crafting section to look at formula. After all, Yura is not just a doctor, she's an alchemist. Yura receives three novice alchemical formula for free thanks to her life path. She picks clotting powder, numbing herbs, and sterilizing fluid. All good things for a doctor to know. She spends crowns to add smelling salts, wives' tears potions, and Ada's tomb to her list. She stops there. She has 16 crowns left to spend when the game begins. Yura's not a priest or a mage, so Jane doesn't have to worry about the magic. If Yura did know magic, though, Jane would have to look at a specific list of how many novice spells, incantations, low danger hexes, and novice rituals she was allowed. She would then go to page 101 and start picking from the lists there. Jane's finished all the fiddly bits of Yura's character creation. All the numbers are set, the dice rolled, and all the gear purchased. She could show up at the table for the next game and start playing. On the other hand, Jane loves writing a good story, so she's going to get together with Yuri's player and build on the background they generated in the life path phase. After all, there's plenty of questions left unanswered. Are their parents retired or still practicing alchemy? Has Yura ever been in love? Who was the mage that saved Yura's life as a child, and whatever happened to her? These are all questions Jane wants to explore so she can give her GM as many story hooks as possible. We hope you enjoyed this video. The Witcher Tabletop RPG and the contents of this video are copyright R. Telzorian Games. The Witcher is a registered trademark of CD Projekt SA, all rights reserved. You can purchase a digital copy of The Witcher Tabletop Roleplaying Game at DriveThruRPG. Physical copies of the book can be purchased from our web store and from your local game retailer. Please visit our blog for more information about the game and for links to our social media including Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for watching and please keep your sword sharp.